Tom Vinipolitan, thank you so much for joining us. Big trial taking place on your front row seat to justice. The trial of a man named James Crumbly, the father of the Oxford school shooter. The Oxford school shooter has been convicted for that mass murder of four innocent students at Oxford High School. And now James Crumbly back in court today for his trial. And the question is, where where is the line going to be drawn for the responsibility of the deaths of these four innocent students from the school? Well, his wife has been convicted already. We saw that trial here on Court TV. Now James Crumbly is on trial. But who else? Who else should be on the hook for all of this? We're going to talk about this um, on, on the program this hour because we had testimony today from folks who worked at the school. And a lot of people are looking at, at that and saying, well, well, wait a minute, right? Like, didn't the school bear some responsibility or should they bear some responsibility for what happened that day? We're gonna talk about that this hour. But first, as I said, another big day inside the courtroom. Let's take a listen to some of the most important testimony from inside. Hi, Sean. The defendant's son is having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. I checked in with the student um, in the hallway in between classes to just let them know that if they were having a hard time, that I was available to talk to you. You did not contact a parent? I did not contact a parent. And tell us why. Because I wanted to gain any information from the student and allow the student the opportunity. You sent this to the student's mother? Yes. At some point, did both James and Jennifer Crumbly come to your office? Yes. Now, what was your expectations of what was to happen at the end of that meeting? My hope was that they were going to take him and either take him to get help or even just to take him to let's have a good day. When the parents came in, I went over all of the things I had seen um, with over my time with the student. I told them that uh, with getting help, I, I said I wanted to see movement on 48 out, within 48 hours and then I'd be following up. Um, and the shooting didn't occur, what, what was your plan? I was going to meet with the student the next morning and see if they had had conversations about it, if they had made some plans to move towards some sort of therapy. And if that didn't occur, what were you going to do? I was going to call Child Protective Services. Now, when you saw this picture, were you considering this in the realm of student discipline? Not at all, no. Okay, I so was you, more concerned um, that there was a mental health concern. And is that so, why you, you decided to get his counselor involved? Yes, that's correct. Now, what was your expectation of what was to happen that day after the meeting with the parents? Uh, my understanding and expectation was that, um, based on the recommendation from the counselor, that the student would be leaving that day. There were three things that and watching the surveillance video from the, the, sh the shooting that I found relevant. And what were they? So the, the first was uh, the stance that the shooter took um, when for the shot that, that killed uh, Tate. Um, I noticed that it, he had had some, some type of firearms training. It appeared to me that he did. Um, he had taken what we refer to as a shooter stance. His shoulders were rolled forward. His feet were, were spread. The second thing was what's called a tactical magazine exchange or what some other departments call a combat reload. His firearm was completely empty, so he loaded a fully loaded magazine into the firearm and continued to shoot. After set, firing several rounds, he ejected that magazine, placed it in his pocket, and then inserted a full magazine into the firearm so that he was um, fully loaded in the firearm. The way we're trained, at least for, for law enforcement shootings, is that if you're involved in an incident, you always want to have as much ammunition as possible. So if you have a, a, a brief moment where the gunfire is low on the gunfire, if you're in a gunfight, would be to eject your partially loaded magazine, insert a full one, but not to throw it on the ground to keep it for later in case you need it. Third thing was when uh, the shooter came out of the bathroom and surrendered to law enforcement. He took the magazine out and placed it on top of a trash bin, uh, which I found uh, 
unique, um, not something that someone would do if they had just committed a mass shooting. Now, here's what we need to remind ourselves of, right, is what happened that day was not the beginning of the shooter's um, behavior. Okay, it wasn't like just this morning he drew a picture and that was it. No, no, let's go back. This was not the first time that the teachers were concerned. Remember, the teachers are the ones on the front line and, and they're noticing behavior by the shooter before the day of the shooting. Take a listen. You were aware that on November 29th of 2021, at the time you received this forwarded email, that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone in class. Yes, after reading this email, I was aware. At some point, well, let me go in order. Shortly after this email, you then met with Mr. Crumbly's son and Pamela Bunny. Yes. And you met in your office or Ms. Fine's office? It was in Ms. Fine's office. And you were there just as support, but Ms. Fine did most of the talking. Is that fair? Yes, I would say that was fair. And Ms. Fine talked to Mr. Crumbly's son about looking at bullets on his phone? She did. Um, she actually asked him to describe why would a teacher be contacting me right now? Um, and the student was forthcoming in what, what had happened in class. He was forthcoming. He was honest. To your knowledge, right? To our knowledge. He shared what we had in the email. He told you what class he was in looking at bullets. He said he was looking at bullets. And he even explained why he was looking at bullets, if you recall. He said that he and mom had been at the shooting range over the weekend. And he was researching what they had done. Okay. So let's, you know, yeah, start putting pieces together. Searching for bullets in class. Now there's knowledge that, yeah, he's at a shooting range with mom. Okay, so let's, let's, let's put two and two together to, to get to four here. Now, the counsel, this is the counselor who's been testifying, Sean Hopkins. Now, so that morning is the picture, you know, the picture with the gun and the blood everywhere. The voices won't stop. Help me. All of this, all of this, he's writing himself. And again, the teacher spots it. They have the meeting. So how does that meeting end? Let's listen. I didn't want him to be alone. So in this context, my thought was when parents were saying they had to return to work, I wanted to make sure the student was with people um, because my concern was him, was his well-being and his, his ability to be safe and cared for. Tell us how the meeting ended. Jennifer asked if they were done, um, which felt abrupt. And uh, during that time, the student had also expressed interest. He, he wanted to go back to class. I asked uh, Mr. Ejack if there was any, like from a discipline standpoint, is there anything you need to do? Is there any reason he, he can't go to class? Um, and I was told no. Um, so I wrote him a pass to return to his end of his third hour. Well, there might be one reason why he might not want to send him to class. Is that, all right, he's written a note drawn a picture of, of, of a gun, blood everywhere, help me, and then scratches it, scratches it out. But they got the image of the original note, and then he altered that note. But no, they're sending him back to class. You, well, you can't go to class without your backpack. Here's the dean. You indicated this backpack was heavy? Um... Yes, such as every other student in the school. And let me clarify, that day, you didn't say that today, that day, November 30th of 2021, you commented to a teacher that the backpack was heavy. Uh, yes, there was, I made a, a joke at how easily she picked it up, and then when, handed, when she handed it off to me, my arm dropped down, um, so it was more of a joke at how strong she was compared to myself. And if you recall, at the time, the students weren't using their lockers? They were not using their so lockers. So it was fairly common for a student's backpack to be heavy? That's correct. You didn't look in the backpack? I did not, no. You didn't, and, and I think you said you didn't have reason to look in the I backpack. I didn't have reasonable suspicion, no. You didn't ask Mr. Crumbly's son to look in his backpack? 
I did not know. You did not ask Mr. Crumbly or his wife to look in the backpack? I did not know. You didn't look yourself or ask anyone else to look because you didn't feel that there was a reason to look in the backpack. Is that fair? There was nothing um, from our conversation or from anything that we had heard so far that would um, indicate it was um, enough to reach to that level, correct? Looking up bullets, drawing pictures, blood everywhere. Help me. The voices won't stop in my head. What? What? Now, uh, Dr. Colin King has been a guest on this show uh, had a, uh, as part of what he did in relation to the cases here. Spoke to the shooter. Spoke to the shooter about this whole meeting. Take a listen. At no point did they say he has to get help today or else we're going to call in law enforcement. At no point did they say that. The shooter said to me, and this is what he said to me, and I've never forgotten this. He said the gun was sitting right on top of the backpack inside. He said, if they had only unzipped that backpack, I was wishing that they would unzip the backpack, and then all of this will be over, and I will get the help that I need. They did nothing. They sent him back to class, and they made sure that he had his backpack. All right, let me bring in my special guest. Joining us tonight in Washington, D.C., former school counselor and board-certified psychotherapist Michael McGill back with us. Michael, great to see you again. Um, what, Good to see you, too. What happened here? Like, what, what is the point of the meeting if we don't, like, have our eyes and ears open? Like, my, the, the meeting was called because of this picture that he drew. Absolutely, Vinny. So many failures, systemic failures, adult failures, parental failures, so many failures. What I know to be true is that for the school counselor to say he didn't have probable cause, I dispute that, I rebuke that. I don't know on, on what planet, Mars, Jupiter, Pluto, or Earth, if a student you presume that a student has a weapon. If they come to you with images saying, I'm in trouble, if teachers are regularly commenting on the student's disposition, if you are even inclined to believe a student has a weapon, they should be high on your priority list. Since Columbine, schools have been known to put uh, procedures in place. They should have been high on the, the administrator's um, list to say, hey, this young man could potentially be a threat. That's all the probable cause you need in a school setting. So, so many failures here. Now, here's the other thing, right? We, I, I go back to shopping for bullets, um, Michael. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a gun guy. But I would think it's a logical presumption to make that someone who shops for bullets is someone who has a gun. Someone who has a gun. He's shopping for bullets in class, then he's drawing a picture of a gun, blood everywhere, right? Help me, the voices won't stop. Like, just a little dose of common sense in the whole thing. Oh yeah, this is the guy who was shopping for bullets. Who shops for bullets? People who have guns. Absolutely. You are totally it. And see, this is the part that I also find to be crazy and extremely, I don't even know the, the word to use. How is it that you can believe that you can purchase a weapon for your child and you are also not held accountable for how that child comports himself with the weapon? I just don't understand. I can't fathom the logic here. But this is another piece, Vinny. This is the part that struck me. The father actually called 911 before the police contacted the father. The father called 911 after he got wind of the school shooting, and he said there may be a possibility my child was involved. If the school or the, the police department never contacted you, why would you think that your child was involved? That tells me the father had some insight, some awareness that something was amiss, some awareness that something was awry. He had some type of cognition that something ain't 
uh, working out up to par here, and yet he did not do his due diligence of securing the welfare of his child. He let the mother run the ship. And I'm all fine for Mama Bear's running the ship. The issue here is Mama Bear dropped the ball. And as the father, he didn't come in to say, hey, something is amiss, something is in trouble. Let me step in and do my due diligence as a parent. All right, how about the school now? You've got a couple incidents. Purchasing bullets, drawing the, making, doing the drawing that he did uh, in class that day. The teachers are on high alert. They're you know, waving red flags everywhere. Why not one simple question to the parents? Do you guys have a gun? Like, they know that he went to the shooting range. They know that he's shopping for bullets. They know he's drawing pictures. Like, how about... The simple question, to me, that's where this, to me, that is gross negligence. That is recklessness mm -hmm. that you're in the position mm -hmm. where you are responsible for the safety of not just this child who's in this meeting, but all the other kids in the school. Right, right. And that's what's so concerning here. It's a juxtaposition because on one hand, they could have asked that question, you know, does he have a weapon or do you all have a weapon? And the parents could have said no. So I, I hear what you're saying and I totally agree with you. But even before we get to that point, all the signs were there that something was amiss and they didn't act accordingly. This is one thing that the dean, I don't know if it was the dean or the school counselor who came and said, well, I just wanted him to be with somebody. I wanted him to be taken that's a away. Counselor. I wanted him to... That was the counselor who said that, who said that I wanted him to get some support. Well, if in fact you wanted the child to get some support and you had enough sense to say, hey, something is amiss, he needs to be taken to get medical, mental health, medical care, and the parents don't oblige, how do you send him back to class? So I agree with you, Vinny, about could they have asked those questions? Yes. Should they have asked those questions? Yes. But before we even get to that point, the fact that he was allowed to go back to class and CPS wasn't called, other interventions didn't take place, other documented strategies weren't implemented, that's where the real uh, piece of... of, of um, what was that word that you used where you said gross negligence? That's where the real negligence came from. When they let him go back to class, they put him back in the general student population, knowing that he could have potentially harmed himself, yet alone harmed other students. What if he had actually harmed himself? They knew they saw all the signs. They asked the parents to intervene. The parents didn't intervene. So now as a mandated reporter, as a school official, you have a legal and an ethical obligation to intervene and they just didn't do that here on so many instances so maybe they're not criminally liable but definitely from a civil standpoint Oof. they can totally be held liable start writing the check start writing the check um, Michael McGill always great to have you on the program incredible insight from all your experience and training uh, thanks so much sir thanks for having me all right folks when we come back we will bring in the think tank they're getting ready you see, Al wasn't ready. Al was half asleep. He's awake now. He's ready. Jennifer's always ready. Darnell, arms crossed. Good to go. What is it? The school versus the dad. Who is more liable in all this? That's next. The first parents in America to be charged in a mass school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter and four counts of it. The gun recovered from the shooter was the same gun that was purchased by his father. Jennifer was found guilty. Who is responsible for storing the gun? Now the school shooter's father is set to stand trial. My husband is. The school shooter dad trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, 8, 7 central on Court TV. They also failed to act. It was recommended at that meeting that James and Jennifer Crumley get help for their son's dead immediately that day. And they were provided with a list of resources with mental health providers that would fit any budget, any insurance plan, or even no insurance at all. But they didn't. James Crumley didn't do anything. Jennifer Crumley didn't do anything. Neither one of them called. They didn't take him home. The reason given to the counselor is that they had to work. But James didn't mention that as a DoorDash driver who set his own schedule. He didn't mention that he hadn't even signed in 
for the day for DoorDash yet. He was at the vet. Or yeah, as a DoorDash driver, he was able to just put his son next to him in the car. He's a DoorDash driver. There's nothing wrong with doing that work. There's nothing wrong with it. But the beauty of being a DoorDash driver is you have some level of flexibility in your work, right? You're not punching a clock. You're logging on when you're ready to deliver some food, and then you deliver until you don't want to deliver anymore. You set your own hours. Your workplace is your car. You could take your son to work, and you're not going to get into trouble. As a matter of fact, he might be able to help you in your door dashing duties. Yet James Crumbly, ah, 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 I don't know, he's drawing pictures of guns and blood. I got to get to work. Come on. And then as soon as something happens, he knows, he knows to call 911 because he knew his son was in a bad place. Unreal. Now, by the way, the gun used for the shooting, we take a look at, at it. Um, you know, here it is. Now, was it locked up and secured? My answer is no, not if he's able to get access to it. You can say you tried to lock it, but it's not secured if he's able to get it. That's obvious. Um, James Crumbly took his son to the range. There they are, walking in together with their little hats, father, son, with their hats and hoodies. And, and again, nothing wrong with spending time with your son going to the gun range. It's not illegal. It's very common in this country. But if he's got... If he's got trouble and he's drawing pictures like he is and he's looking for help, you need to help your son and you need to let everyone know what's going on. Um, and here's some video of the shooter shooting. And this is, again, taken by dad. Again, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing here. This is fine. But for the fact that he is suffering, he is suffering. He is not mentally right. He needs help. Didn't get it. But how about the father's liability versus the school? Like the school's responsible not just for him, but for all the other kids there. And you got a you got a student drawing pictures, looking to buy bullets in class, and it's like no big deal. Also looking at a video, a violent video that same morning. And they're not putting two and two together here. Let's bring our think tank joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch the third. Also with us in Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossling. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the reasonable one, family law attorney Jennifer Brand is with us. Great to see everyone. Al, the school versus the father. I see fault in both. I'm having a hard time, you know, in, in, in seeing the father so much more at fault that he's on the hook criminally and the school isn't. Well, I, I don't know how you can blame the school. I mean, I, I think that there is an issue with regards to how far a school can go with regards to what they think and what they can prove. And the problem that they would have is like, so they, what if they say they, they keep the kid out and it turns out that he becomes Stephen King and this is just the way he writes his horror stories and there was nothing wrong with him. Then they're going to be sued. Sued so, for mean, what? It's a very, very sued for what? For for discrimination, no discrimination. Oh, if you if you take a kid out of school without a legitimate reason, okay. That look, the fact that he wrote he made some some horrible pictures and some stuff like that, is one thing. They sat there, they talked with it. It is really the parents' deal, okay. The parents should have said, oh, by the way, we bought him a gun, okay. And then I guarantee you they would have looked in that bag. So. That's it's it's the parents' fault more so than the school. Schools ha schools wrists are tied. They're handcuffed as to what they can do and what they can't do. Whether they can get into their locker, or not get into their locker. Get into their bag, not get not get into their bag. When do they violate their civil rights? Okay, I mean it's a horrendous situation to throw it on either one. And and hindsight's always twenty twenty. Oh, if I had only done this, I had only done that. Okay, the bottom line is is that these parents bought a kid with severe mental issues, a handgun, and gave him that opportunity to own it and to use it. That's where the line gets drawn, okay? They had a duty to protect the, the general public from their kid. The school, all right, maybe they facilitated something, but they're not responsible. 
Of oh. course, they disagree with me. But what else is now? No. Disagree. Uh, Vinny, Vinny, this is uh, Al is absolutely off the mark on this one, and and specifically when he says that the school's hands are tied. I've had over the last 17 years several cases involving schools and situations where uh, there was sus sus uh, suspicion that contraband was in a backpack of, of a, a student. And what, what I noticed is um, I had to fight as a defense attorney uh, many days where the resource officer, who's a deputized police officer, uh, could not go into a kid's school bag without all of the bells and whistles that we talked about, reasons with reasonable suspicion, probable cause, because he's a police officer. What, but what they were doing was having the school counselor and these people go in their bags because they didn't need that same uh, clearance. So in this, and, and, and they, they were wrong in my cases, obviously, because um, they're always wrong in my cases. But, but in this case, um, they would have been right. And they should have used that opportunity to say, well, we're not police officers. Um, and this, and if we think there's something that's wrong here, that we don't have to have reasonable, reasonable uh, okay. suspicion Darnell, probable Darnell, cause. Darnell, no, was it we, 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 what was the contraband? What was the contraband? No, 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 Let Perry Mason tell us what the contraband is. It's not just the contraband. What was the contraband? It's not the contraband. Was it drugs? It was not the contraband. It's not contraband. Was it drugs? Was it drugs? It's concern. Okay, drugs smell. You can see that kind of stuff. You're home. It's Jennifer's turn. Time for some reason. It's my turn. Okay, here's the thing, Vinny. It's not like the school didn't know about this. They knew about it. The teachers were sp suspicious of this child. The teachers were concerned. They brought it to the school's attention, to the administrator's attention, the counselor's attention. Everybody knew what was going on, that there was some problem going on here. This kid is shopping for bullets, drawing pictures. Like you said, I mean, it doesn't take much to put this all together. And in this environment today, there is heightened awareness in all schools about a tragedy like this that could potentially happen. So schools are should be on alert for this, and they send these kids home. They send them out of the school. They don't wait around. They don't send them back to class. When there's a situation like this and the parents, they called the parents in, they thought it was serious enough to bring these parents in for a school meeting. And when the parents said, oh, too bad, I got to go to work or whatever, I don't really care. To send a kid back into class because they needed him to be around people after all this had happened, send that kid to the hospital. Call law enforcement. Call he, somebody. They Jennifer, have he's literally, if not illegal. literally yes, writing, exactly. help me. He literally wrote, exactly. help me. Like, and he give Al back his, his exhibit, please. He's getting jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Get him some help. You know, that's what the school had the obligation to do and to protect the other students in that school because something was going on and everybody knew about it. And so, I yes, I believe that the school should have done something. The parent, help me. James Crombley. Do, yeah, the, do, he, the, do the parents... Do the parents tell oh, the no, school? Oh, no, but the parents the have, a, has a, have an obligation. Does the, yeah, do the well, parents that, tell the that school, never by the way... He's looking at bullets because we bought him a gun. No, they don't say. They didn't need to. Okay. They didn't need to, Al. Well, because I have to tell you that he has a gun. Out. Who else is assume. shopping for bullets, Al? Who's shopping for bullets that I doesn't have was. a gun? I just was, Vin. While you would uh, would disturb me when I was going through it, and it doesn't matter. The parents had a duty to tell the, the school. By the way, we bought the kid oh, a gun. Way, kid what a brilliant a move. That was an early Christmas present. And boy, are we stupid. Yeah. Okay. Well, the school they knew that he had been at the shooting that. range. They knew that he had been I mean, at the shooting know, range. They had a conversation with the mother about the shooting range. Right. And nobody said a word. Like, hey, does this what? child have a gun? Have does he have access to a gun? Why didn't anybody ask those questions? I mean, the signs are all right there. The kid had said he'd been to the shooting range. What does he go with? Nothing in his hand? I mean, clearly they, they knew that there was something going on. And yes, I mean, it, the, the parents have it, even a greater obligation, I think, than the school. The, but, you know, we were, that's why he's on trial. And that's why the mother is the, going the, to jail. Because it's, it's important. Have the Crumbies don't have that. The Crumbies don't have the obligation to help the school. The school has the obligation to protect no. other students. So that's the bottom line. With, with the Crumbleys, well, the line, they did though, more great. The but line. there's other innocent there's other innocent students that were, right. were killed Based the on bottom the school's line failure, not the Crumbly's is failure. That, that is that the school certainly has a responsibility, but not criminal. That's the difference here. Okay. okay. There is a responsibility, but it's not criminal. We, 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 we got him to uh, uh, concede that point to a certain extent. We shall see. <laughs>
And, and obviously the civil case uh, will, will continue.